Hey, we're having lunch here at uh, BJ's Brew House in Avon, and we're masking up and masking down because we're having a good time. And there's a there's a method to the madness. Uh, in 2001, my buddy Milt Thompson, right here, we're dining together, and I sat down for an interview that uh, we're going to play for you in just a minute. But we wanted to give it some context. Um, Obviously, we were younger then, I think. Oh, I know that we were younger yeah. than 2000. And um, we were shaving more then. We even looked younger then. Uh, we, did, we, we looked and sounded younger. Yes, we did. But um, as you will see, I'd just taken a job at DePaul University. Milt was my agent when I worked in television. We're old friends. And uh, we're young friends, actually. But we've been <laughs> friends for a long we've time. We've been younger friends before, that's for certain. <laughs> but, you know, we can take our masks off and keep distance and, uh, and still love each other. Uh, one of my best friends in the world. And um, this was a magical thing. I mean, we, we, we kind of just, as you do, as I do, winged it. And it, uh, it, was, it was a fun you know, 25 or 28 minutes. If I recall that particular interview, uh, which is very difficult to get me to do, is to shut up and listen. But I literally, uh, I, I don't think that I over-talked in that one. Sometimes I try to interview myself while I'm interviewing someone else, but I think in that one, what you had to say was so fascinating about where were you, what did you have done, some of the ventures that you'd taken, undertaken as a, as a newscaster. And uh, so I found it so interesting that I mostly kind of gave you the, the toss up and you, you, you swung for it. <laughs> and you know, the irony is about 20 years later, I'm as dull as a doornail. So yeah, you can watch this and actually see what it was like when I actually th had things going on. But right now I'm saving money on razors and um, drinking uh, a, a beer at lunch, which is, that may be the upside of COVID. I don't know. It's Thursday and it's okay. It is. This is a throwback Thursday. And yesterday was Wednesday and it was okay then. But um, always great to see you. <laughs> Good and, to see uh, you, my friend. We're gonna now uh, hit the button like um, Michael J. Fox did on the car and go back about 20 years. And you're gonna see two youngish guys. We're still youngish, but we were younger, youngish. Um, talking about life, having some laughs and sharing some insights. Enjoy. Good morning, and welcome to Indiana Focus. I'm your host, Milt Thompson, and this week we're going to have one of those features that I promised you um, well, a while back. We're going to say, where are they now? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you where they are now. They're sitting right here in, <laughs> in Uncle Millie's den here in the studio. We're talking with my friend uh, Ken Owen. Ken, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me, Milt. It's great to see you, and uh, I'm glad to know where I am now. I've been wondering myself. Well, Ken uh, is no... Uh, stranger to uh, being behind or in front of a camera. This time he's going to be a little bit of the hot seat because he's not asking the questions as he might typically do uh, in his uh, long uh, career as a uh, television news journalist. Uh, tell us about that long career back then before we get into what and where are you now. Oh, let's clear away the cobwebs. Let's see. <laughs> I, uh, I um, graduated from DePaul University where I now work in 1982 and I, I was already working on wire radio in Indianapolis, which is now WNXT or XNT, the, the news station, 1430 AM. Worked a year at uh, WIBC under Fred Heckman, and Channel 59 went on the air. And I got a phone call that they liked my work on the radio, and they wanted to see what I looked like on television. So I literally came into a studio and auditioned at a card table and uh, had never seen a teleprompter before in my life. Some people would argue after 18 years on television, I'd never seen a teleprompter before in my life. But You don't, uh, you don't notice one in this studio. No. Okay, this, 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 this is... is this is purely this is purely <laughs> extemporaneous, folks. If you're watching Milt Thompson at home, you know this is the real deal. The guy's speaking from the heart. <laughs> you go for it. Uh, you know. But uh, uh, did that for a year. Literally, they hired me to be the news anchor at age 23, and I got a David Bowie perm, and it was you know kind of a strange time in my life. I was you know fear full of yourself when you're a 23 year old news anchor. Reality came crashing down about eight months later when they realized they could make a lot more money showing Rosemary's Baby uh, movies <laughs> in every. They showed it like every three nights on the station, I think, but then they could in doing news where you had to have a, a staff and we had 15 or 20 people working all day long on a half hour of news. It began as an hour, went down to a half an hour. So there was no more news at Channel 59 and I went to, uh, I got very lucky, 
Got a job in Fort Wayne at Wayne TV, the CBS affiliate, was the main anchor there for three years. Went to Asheville, Greenville, Spartanburg, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina. Worked at Asheville's WLOS for two years as the main anchor. And then came back here in 1989 to be Mike Ahern's backup at Channel 8, essentially. And worked there nine years. Uh, a great time, uh, Lee Giles and Mike and Debbie and the whole gang. We, we really, uh, we saw the station go to number one. They were certainly the halcyon days for, for us then. And I left, uh, I guess late 97 and went to work for, maybe it was 98. It all runs together, but I went and worked for Channel 6 for a couple of years. And I hit 40 and it uh, became clear to me that television wasn't the business that it had been when I was a young man. And uh, I sought out new pastures. Lots of changes, lots of memories, but a lot of time mm -hmm. in front of the camera, which mm -hmm. means that there were a lot of time you spent behind the scenes, if you will. Um, tell us about one of the more memorable news stories, perhaps, that uh, you'd worked on. I think uh, a career highlight for me certainly would have been uh, when I was in North Carolina, I was working in the market in which Billy Graham lived. He lives in Montreat, North Carolina, and the station was in Asheville. And uh, it would have been the summer of 1988. I was called into the news director's office and he said, we're going to send you to Russia for 10 days. And of course, I'm thinking it's summer and there's a lot of things I can do here. And obviously, it's a very exciting opportunity. Um, being a young man, though, I didn't really understand the implications of it. I got to go, and I didn't realize until after I came back that we had diplomatic visas. But just before the fall of the Soviet Union, and, and watch Billy Graham uh, observe the millennium of the Russian Orthodox Church, it was a, a historic moment because for years, of course, since the revolution of 1917, people could not openly, publicly profess their faith, and they were having parades, and uh, it was televised. Raisa Gorbachev, who was the, uh, the uh, Premier's wife, uh, Mr. Mikhail Gorbachev's wife, uh, was at the ceremonies, and uh, so it was really a watershed moment in, in Russian history. And of course, about a year later, the Soviet Union was no more, and uh, we've seen a lot of change since then. But uh, to be there and to have a bird's eye view, to literally be standing and sitting as close as I am to you, to Billy Graham, at that time was uh, amazing. And it, it it really taught me a lot about citizenship, about you know how great America is, and I'm not a jingoistic drum beater, but uh, when I came back I literally kissed the ground at Kennedy Airport because the food over there was not very good and the people, uh, they were so hungry for change, especially the young people. The older people were of course worried about what might happen to their lives if, if the government didn't pay them to, to farm a certain amount of land, whether or not they grew anything didn't matter. That was the way communism worked. But they, uh, 201, would come up to me with a lot of curiosity about America. And the young people had Rolling Stone magazine, and they were very up to date on American culture and film and rock music. And uh, it, it was clear that things were percolating, things were about to change, and uh, they did. Modern news is really uh, uh, not enough time to really get you very in-depth, so what were some of the techniques to be able to be able to draw those experiences? You get a few minutes there to talk mm -hmm. about that experience here when really, outside of it being a story, um, you were really kind of in sound bites. Uh, yeah. uh, what, what, what do you do to try to familiarize uh, a, an audience uh, on a story that's much more in-depth than a few minutes will allow? You go to your producers, you get on your knees, and you say, please, I need the time. That's, that's the, the best technique, usually. But uh, unfortunately, you're right. I think as time has gone by, in 1988, you could have been allotted three or four or five minutes within a newscast for a special piece like that. And you still see that occasionally. But it's more often, and uh, I don't mean to be cynical, uh, and I don't think I am, it's more often about uh, uh, someone who's uh, maybe a government official who's done something wrong or uh, some kind of scandal within state government or something. You know, those are the pieces that get that kind of attention, the, the longer form investigative pieces. And this certainly uh, was a story we spent a lot of time and, and money and energy on. But uh, I think things have changed a bit now. I think to go to a producer today and say, I need five or six minutes, five nights this week to bring you the story of Billy Graham in Russia, uh, they'd say, well, where, where's the, you know, what are you going to tell us tonight? Where's the sex appeal? How do we tease it? And uh, it's really not one of those stories that is fit to be teased. It's, it's, it needs to be ingested kind of slowly like a good meal. And uh, we were very lucky in the fact that we were able to do an hour-long documentary, which won a national award, uh, which allowed us to use a lot of the footage that otherwise would have never seen the light of day. A little more name drop time here for you, Ken. You <laughs> killed Gorbachev, obviously a seminal uh, opportunity and experience for you uh, when you were broadcasting the news. Um, others that you've had the opportunity to meet, uh, perhaps with even a little lighter um, side of the world. 
Oh, well, I, I, I'm a huge music aficionado, and I, I, I still pinch myself to think that when Paul McCartney came back to Indianapolis in 1990, he had a news conference at Market Square Arena. And uh, it's one of those weird moments because I've been in a lot of news conferences. I've been at the White House. I've been, uh, obviously, a lot of smaller events. But usually when a, a person walks into a room, a politician or someone, they command a certain amount of respect. But people are ready and, and probably overly anxious to begin the questioning because they have things they want to ask. When Paul McCartney walks into a room, he's so, he's really mastered the loosey-goosey thing. You know, he walks in, he just looks like he's having a good time, and he probably is, but uh, he's very happy with himself. He puts everybody at ease, but there was this kind of silence when he walked in, because what he asked Paul McCartney, he's heard everything probably that could ever be asked. So uh, I utilized the opportunity of the two or three seconds of silence that followed his sitting down and asked him about uh, the, the Beatles' trip to Indianapolis in 1964, and Ringo disappearing overnight when he was driving around up in Carmel with the state trooper. You read that, about that story. I, yeah. I, I, I remember it. Yeah. See, there's a difference between... There's a big difference. And, of course, I think, you know, you might have been six then and I might have been four. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, that, that was really neat. And um, and I think at the end of the, the answer, he actually winked at me. So that, that was also kind of a neat thing. Because, you know, you grow up and you, you admire certain people. But uh, that was certainly uh, a moment I'll remember. And... Uh, you know, if I think enough about it, there's, there's 10 or 12 other things like that. Well, we are visiting with uh, Ken Owen here on Indiana Focus on uh, Where Are They Now version of <laughs> our show. And where he is right now is right here in our studios. And we're going to be right back and talk with a little bit more after these short words. To Indiana Focus, I'm your host, Milt Thompson. We've been talking on our Where Are They Now version of uh, the Indiana Focus show, and we're visiting with Ken Owen, very familiar face to many of you uh, throughout the uh, Indiana and really around uh, the country in certain marketplaces as a uh, former news anchor and spent a lot of time uh, visiting with him about that in the first segment, but there are a lot of other things that go into making up the man that is Ken Owen, and that is uh, some of the work that he accomplishes today. Uh, Ken is uh, no longer uh, in front of a camera, except for today, but uh, outside of that, he still spends uh, his time in uh, media relations as director of media relations at DePaul University. Now, that sounds like one of those jobs that anybody who leaves a set would just love to have. Tell us about it and how all that came about and what are your responsibilities on a daily basis? Well, I, you know, I, I guess when you're working in journalism for a long time, you have a bit of um, a funny attitude toward PR people because, uh, yeah, there's the sense that you're drinking coffee all day long and reading newspapers, and there's some of that, certainly. But, um, and I think there's also the sense that uh, when you're a journalist, it, it's a very proud fraternity and you're out there seeking information and you are the final arbiter of what goes into your story, what doesn't go into your story, and the PR people are out there kind of selling you on something, you know. It's like selling dish soap. Um, I was, uh, I just turned 40 as I mentioned earlier and uh, I, the, the TV news business had changed quite a lot. I really didn't fancy working till 11.30 at night anymore. Uh, I didn't uh, enjoy wearing makeup after a certain point in my life. I mean, there, there were many, many, many good things about TV news, but I almost felt it was a Peter Pan moment that I, I needed to grow up. And so uh, I started to explore opportunities outside of television, and some were in Chicago, uh, which is where I grew up. Some were uh, in different parts of the country, and uh, I was on the alumni board at DePauw because I'm an alumnus myself. And somewhere along the line, they had been asking me, uh, we're looking for a director of media relations. Do you have any, any ideas on, on who we might talk with? And I gave them a couple of names. And invariably, the question was posed again. We're still looking for someone. What do you think? And I think at one point, I just said, well, I'll talk to you, kind of half jokingly, because uh, I love DePauw. I've always been actively involved in the university. And uh, I have Ponce de Leon moments going back to that campus, you know, where the windows are rolled down and you literally feel like you're 18 years old again going to campus for the first time. So yeah, I was a little worried about making it my workplace and, and losing that kind of wonderful feeling you have when you go back for football games and that DePaul is a special place where um, those things happen. Um, it took some convincing on the part of our president, Dr. Robert Bottoms, to uh, convince me that this is something that would be be right for me because I was still in television and I was still enjoying uh, 
many facets of my life in television, but I must say it, it's just been a marvelous experience because I've learned a lot about myself. Um, I've, I've got much more flexibility in terms of my life and in terms of uh, you know, working regular office hours. The, uh, the only difference between television and, and PR is uh, in television you know at 6.30 when the show is over or 11.30 that your day is done. It's been broadcast and the tape goes on a shelf somewhere to be perhaps looked at later, perhaps disposed of down the road, but that's, you know, the chapter ends, the book closes. Whereas in PR, uh, if a building burns, as it did April of last year at DePauw, a dormitory caught fire and uh, you know, your phone rings at 7.30 in the morning or at 3 in the morning a student reporter is putting the student newspaper to bed and has a question that he needs answered or she needs answered, uh, it's, it's kind of a 24-hour a day, we never close job. And that took some getting used to, but uh, I love DePauw and it's not like selling dish soap. It's, it's, it's near and dear to me. It's a story I like to tell, and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful fit. Well, the story of liberal arts education <coughs> excuse me, versus that of large state institutions, the degree to which now the value is being questioned by those folks that have uh, young people ready to go off to college. And mm -hmm. And looking at that price tag versus that of uh, perhaps uh, getting a computer, computer science degree at a larger state institution sure. where it makes more sense, the economic times that are out there. Um, you and I are both products of small liberal arts kind of uh, uh, educations. Uh, mm -hmm. I think my daughter is about to head off uh, to, to, to one uh, with a pretty hefty uh, price tag on it. Um, uh, it's tougher to con convince um, people these days that there's that much difference uh, in, the, in the value of that education versus they, what they get someplace else. Is that part of your job and role and what kind of response do you have to those skeptics? Well, I, I mean, obviously I'm answering a question here, so it is part of my job and, and, and certainly uh, differentiating DePaul from the PAC is, is a big part of my job. And a very interesting statistic, I didn't know this myself, but our Vice President for Admission was telling me recently that the average family income of a family that sends a child to DePaul versus IU or Purdue is about $10,000 less. In other words, DePaul's financial aid packages are, are so full that uh, many students uh, qualify for a DePaul education that you wouldn't think do. We have many first generation college students. It is not a, um, a country club uh, for people of, of means. I think that uh, that's one thing that needs to be pointed out. And I think y when you have an average class size of uh, 12, 14 students, and the faculty-student ratio is one to 10. In other words, there's one faculty member for every 10 students on campus. Uh, that creates an environment where some really terrific learning can take place. When I was in high school, um, I, was, uh, I was good at, at certain things and not good at others. And I think my, uh, my transition to college was difficult. And I think if I'd gone to a state school, I might have had a much different experience because I got to college and of course I got involved in the radio station. I was playing baseball. I was in plays. I, I hit it way too hard and I had no idea of how much time and energy uh, was going to be required for me to be studying on top of all that. And, and uh, what DePaul did for me is uh, with a 10 or 12 or 14 student classroom and I had some that were three or four, if you have a problem in your class, your professor is there. You can walk in the door. He knows who you are, she knows who you are, you sit down and your questions are answered. And there is a level of caring and understanding, I think, that perhaps you don't get at a state institution. Now, having said that, state schools do a lot of things well, too. And uh, not every uh, situation is, is right for everyone. Students have to look at what their needs are and what they have uh, in terms of uh, uh, financial aid opportunities and uh, their family finances. But I think, uh, and, and I know that you agree because we came out of the same canoe, that uh, the small college experience has a lot uh, going for it. If you look at um, DePaul University is ranked 10th uh, in the nation in the number of CEOs it produces. Uh, it, it, we're, we're very high on a lot of national ratings. Three years in a row in the top tier of U.S. News and World Reports. Uh, national Liberal Arts Co Colleges, we're, we are the uh, top rated National Liberal Arts College in Indiana. So. Uh, there, there's value there. Yeah, and there's a lot of rivalry between uh, other small schools around that makes sense. But speaking of that, you've had some uh, news packaging experience that you've now brought uh, to DePaul, and uh, you have a pretty famous football game with one of your other Indiana small rivals. Uh, tell us about some packaging that you were involved in to uh, uh, try to market and sell, if you will, that to a larger audience. Well, it's, uh, it's obviously uh, Division Three athletics is a hard sell because the students are playing for the love of the game. There are no scholarships in Division Three, 
which in some ways makes it an easier sell because I think we're at a point in our, our history where people are becoming a bit jaded by uh, kids going right from high school to the NBA. I mean, it, there, there seems to be a money trail, uh, not that there's anything going on behind the scenes, but young people are becoming athletic and involved in athletics because they see dollar signs at the end of the rainbow. And when you've got two schools with very strong academic reputations, DePauw and Wabash, uh, who have taken to the football field for more than 100 years in this rivalry, which is tied at 50, 50, and 9, I believe is the number right now. It's really an amazing game, and, and incredible things happen every year. Um, the game two years ago, which DePauw tied, I think, with eight seconds left, and then Wabash threw a Hail Mary with time literally off the clock to win on a tip pass. Um, you, you can't write scripts that, that Hollywood would develop that are as good as the Monon Bell football game. So with that in mind, um, and obviously TV revenues are uh, uh, going out for small networks and, and finding college football is difficult because they're all tied up with the majors. So we've got a deal now with HDNet, which is a high definition uh, satellite company. And, and they're you're going to be bringing those together in, on, on television to help generate some additional revenue through its alumni base. We'll talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit more, a little bit more about Ken Owen and his current life on where are they now here on Indiana Focus. We'll be right back. Indiana Focus, we're talking with Ken Owen, a very familiar face uh, for those of you who have uh, witnessed uh, television news in Central Indiana for the last uh, few decades. But also, uh, now the uh, media relations director at DePaul University is alma mater and was just telling us about how you'd gotten the Monon uh, Bell game uh, with Wabash and DePaul. Uh, in television shape uh, for uh, television production. Mm -hmm. and, and just in, in brief, we've typically uh, put it up ourselves in the satellite and had alumni parties around the country. The HDNet deal will allow us to uh, obviously broadcast in the highest quality available. And they're going to rebroadcast the game several times. So it will be seen by a national audience. It'll be in appliance stores around the country, people who've never heard of DePaul and Wabash. And hopefully everyone has heard of DePaul. But for those who may still need to be enlightened a bit, uh, there'll be people who will have their first contact, really, with the, the Mona Bell football game through HDNet. So it's exciting for us, and we hope it's a long-term partnership. Frankly, I'm, in, uh, I'm uh, maybe overwhelmed by the uh, impact of uh, television. For years, you've sat in people's living rooms um, uh, and uh, in, in their kitchens and talk with them. And, and, um, and, and you've been off the air for a time, but uh, the, the familiarity and the impact of uh, that familiarity is still kind of ongoing. Uh, tell us about that quote unquote uh, celebrity status, if you will, as you go from place to place. It, it's a funny thing because when you're doing it, I think there's a four or five year period where you come to a place like Indianapolis and you're on the air every night and you could walk through a shopping mall and someone might say something, but it's about the fifth or sixth year where you can't go many places without people just kind of looking at you like, are you the plumber? Did you do my taxes last year? You know, who are you? And so it is funny, and I think it is the gift that keeps on giving. I've been off the air now for a couple of years, a year and a half, and uh, people still stop me on a daily basis and say, I watch you every night. I love right, your work. Right, and right. you get to a point where you don't want to correct you them correct because, them, because, say, yes. uh, <laughs> because they often their faces fall and they say, why did you leave? <laughs> I thought I saw you last night. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt about so yeah, you don't want to make them look like they're you know, not really paying attention, although we're all so busy. It seems like I was on last night. Well, Ken, that was the uh, world of uh, uh, journalism um, in our last uh, wrap-up minute here. Um, tell, uh, tell our folks here who have uh, followed your career um, something about yourself that perhaps they don't know. Oh gosh, uh, I, I, would, I would think a lot of people um, might not know that I'm, I'm still very involved in charities around Indianapolis. I think it's really important that especially people who are in the public eye uh, do things. Uh, they don't have to be high profile things, but uh, do things to make the world a better place. It's a very lucky position to be in. There aren't many people that have the opportunity to, as you say, get into people's living rooms every night, and so I always took that very seriously. Um, I'm back to running every other day if my old knees will hold up, and uh, I enjoy uh, music and movies and working on my house. I'm living out in Avon now, so life is good. And uh, I miss my friends in television, and I, I watch them all the time, and, and I miss those of you on the other side who used to watch me. Ken, and they miss you too, and uh, we are going to have to take advantage of some opportunities to see what other things other people can be involved with in our community with our community calendar.
get up and run. Don't walk. Run like Ken Owen to take advantage of the wonderful uh, community events that go on. I want to thank Ken Owen on Where Are They Now? We know. I want to thank you for being on our show this week. It's my pleasure, Mel. Thanks for all you do for the community. I and we'll it. want to see you right back here next week for another version of Indiana Focus. We'll see you then.